Tonight, we were going to jam to some real music. And it is really our pleasure to have with us this international reggae star, Jimmy Cliff. We have looked out as a department because we now have two for the price of one. Jimmy will talk a little bit about his work. Um, and his work is related to our reggae poetry course, but also he has been involved in that very signature film of Jamaica, The Harder They Come. And so both film studies and our poetry courses will benefit from his presence. We look forward to hearing his creative journey, the story of his creative journey, and insights into his work. And at the end of the day, I'm sure we'll all be inspired by what he has to say. Welcome to all. Thank you for coming, and we look forward to this wonderful occasion. Thank you. They say that a prophet is not recognized in his own land, but Dr. the Honorable Jimmy Cliff is certainly recognized and celebrated a yard. He's a recipient of the Order of Merit from the Government of Jamaica and the Honorary Doctor of Letters from the University of the West Indies, both in recognition of his contribution to the film and music of Jamaica. Further afield, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of, Fame, Hall of Fame in 2010, and last year he received the Luminary Award from the UWI Toronto Alumni Chapter. Born James Chambers in 1948 in St. James, Jimmy Cliff has been making music since his childhood. He began entering local talent contests and pursuing potential producers as an adolescent. By the time he was 14, he had released several singles, including Hurricane Hattie. I don't know if anybody remembers that one. Hurricane Hattie, his first hit. Soon after that, he was producing local hits regularly. I don't have the time to give an, an exhaustive account of a career that spans several decades, but here are just a few highlights. Of course, we know that Jimmy Cliff starred in and produced much of the soundtrack for the film The Harder They Come, released in 1972 and directed by Perry Henson, a film which has met with great success around the globe and which was responsible in taking reggae to an international audience for the first time. Over the years, Cliff has played and recorded with many well-known artists including Cool and the Gang, Sting, Annie Lennox, and the Rolling Stones. His songs have been covered by such diverse talents as Willie Nelson, Bruce Springsteen, Cher, New Order, and Fiona Apple. After all this time, Cliff continues to make music, tour, and record. He won the Grammy Award for Best Reggae Album in 2013 for Rebirth. Cliff says about this album, quote, the album is about my rebirth as an artist and as a man, but also about the rebirth of the world. I, I couldn't really come up here and speak without saying just a little bit about the harder they come, uh, which, as Carolyn said, I have taught uh, in film courses here at UWE for over five years, um, you know, every year, and I've watched it more times than I can. Uh, remember or count, but I still find it a powerful film every time I watch. And one of my favorite moments in that film is the sequence with Many Rivers to Cross, where Ivan walks into the yard of an uptown lady, uptown woman, and begs for money. Uh, and in that scene, after the uptown woman's terrain, in which she tells Ivan, stop begging, you should go and look for work. And that song, Many Rivers to Cross, comes up. And without saying a word, it really speaks. Ivan doesn't say a word, but that song speaks very powerfully for Ivan and gives the viewer his point of view. Uh, so we generally talk about a film and refer to it through the name of the director. But I think that we really can't imagine the harder they come 
without the presence of Jill Cliff and certainly not without his music. So ladies and gentlemen, I take great pleasure in introducing uh, the Honorable, Dr. The Honorable Jimmy Taylor. Thank you very much indeed. I greet you in one of the ancient, one of the most ancient languages. The greetings of Ashuk. It means divine love. So I greet you with divine love, or I would say, blessed love to you all. I started my career when uh, my mother pushed me out and I said, I never stopped. You know, uh, I remember things from the age of like two. Uh, I grew up in the country, Somerton, St. James. Exactly, Delphiland, St. James. And uh, it was the time when sugar was made by the horse going around in a circle with the thing and made what we call wet sugar then. So there was this woman called Miss Dill and she would be passing through with her cursing tin of wet sugar. When I was about two, two and a half, she would always come and say, uh, sing like your mother, laugh like your mother. And I go, <laughs> she would take up a little wet sugar and give me my hand and I eat it with coconut. So I always knew that I belonged somewhere in the arts. In school, I was pretty good at academics, but what got my attention was always when it came to the arts, whether it was drawing or uh, sculpture, because we did some of that back in the days, or acting, which was the one that I really loved. Singing too, but acting was what I really loved. So I knew it belonged in the hearts. Um, well, I started writing songs, and how I knew that I wanted to do the singing was, I heard a music on the radio, and uh, they said that was a local artist. I said, wow, local artist, and there was music on the radio. And uh, I asked my woodwork teacher, Mr. Stewart, I said, did he write that song himself? He said, yes, I, they said he wrote it himself. I said, how do you write the song? He said, you just write it. <laughs> so, I started writing some songs. I wrote a song about uh, I need a fiance. <laughs> I go wooing, wooing, wooing for just for a fiance. I didn't even know what fiance means. <laughs> but it sounded good. <laughs> so then I wrote songs also about back to Africa. And that so when I was about 13, it wasn't like that back in the days you left school when you became 13, 14. So I turned 13, so my father said, well, you know, it's about time you start thinking about what you want to do as a career. So I spoke to one of, uh, my father and I spoke to one of the teachers. He said, you know, what should we do with the boy? She said, you know, the boy can sing. Well, um, she said, why don't you send him to Kingston to go to a school? So that's what, that's what he did. So I came to Kingston and I went to, to go to Kingston Technical evening classes. But really and truly my aim was to find a 
find a way how to record these songs that I started writing. So I get to Kingston and uh, started asking around how, how do you get your songs recorded. So I found out how it worked at the days when it was the sound system operators who did all the recordings, whether it was Coxon, Duke Creek, King Edwards, whoever. So I visited all of them. They all turned me down. They didn't like my voice. <laughs> And uh, I told this part of the story over and over, but I'll tell it again to you, you know. One night I was walking on Orange Street and uh, just about really frustrated and about to go home. And I looked up and I saw a sign, Mark Beverly's Records. And an uh, idea came to my head. I said, I was I had an idea for the song called Dearest Beverly. So right away, like in five, ten minutes, I finished the song. And uh, I go down to the, to the store. It was a, a, a restaurant, a record shop, and an ice cream parlor. And they were closing. I, as they were closing, I put my foot in the door. They said, who are you? You see, you're clumsy. Move. Anyway, I kept my foot there. I said, I'm a singer. I'm a singer. I'm, I can sing. You know? And uh, the brothers, there were three Chinese brothers, say, uh, who is it? And I said, uh, you know, I'm a singer. I can sing. And they, one of the brothers said, OK, let him in. So I went in, and I said, I can sing. And, uh, well, two of the brothers kind of laughed, and uh, one of the brothers said, okay, go on and sing. So I sang a song for the Paris Beverly that I was writing, and uh, he went like, hmm, he said, the best voice I ever heard in Jamaica. He used to go like, I pull up his, his shirt collar, and I said, yes, to myself, you know. I felt I had the best voice in the <laughs> So, um, the other brothers laughed. So, that was my beginning. He had a recording session. He got other artists like Derek Morgan and Monty Maros, who were big stars at the time. And he did a recording session. I did a record, I recorded a session. My song didn't turn out to be, it made any impact or anything. But the second recording session he did, I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I wrote this song called Hurricane Hattie of a hurricane that, that uh, was in uh, Belize. And that was my first number one song. Then I went on to write songs like King of Kings, Miss Jamaica, One Eye Jacks. I had a string of number one hits. And uh, I just continued. Then I got invited to go to New York uh, on the first trip that they had to promote, to try to promote Jamaican music outside of Jamaica. And uh, I met the boss of Island Records, Chris Blackwell, who offered me a contract to say, come to England. I think you could do it. Right to go to England. I felt like America was the better place for me. You know, he said, Well, you know, you're better off in England. Look at Willie Small, look what I did for her. You have a better voice, you could do better for her. I considered that after about you know, three, four months, I decided to take his offer and went to England. I went to England and I wanted to come back on the same flight. It was so cold. <laughs> Fog and all of these uh, houses, with every, every house had a chimney. And I said, oh, now I know why so many Jamaicans are coming to England to get work. All these chimneys, everywhere, everywhere there's a factory. <laughs> there was the factory, of course. The houses and the houses, they were, they were you know, for, for the heat. The heating, I, I didn't know about those things. So I stayed in England for a number of years. I 
recorded some songs. And England was a great, great, great experience for me. So I had my own band. They were all British. I had to teach them to play the ska. It was the ska era. I had to teach them how to play the ska. And uh, while I was in England, the music changed to rock steady. I came back started to record some rock steady thing, then the music changed to, to reggae, and then I started recording some reggae songs. So, you know, I was there with it from the scrap to rock steady to reggae. So, then came the Heart of the Come movie. And by that time, I was established as a big recording star in in Europe and all over the world, for that matter. You know, I had it's like wonderful world, beautiful people, wild world, Vietnam, you know, all those hits. And I was also a producer, I produced hits for the pioneers that you gave year, I produced hits for Desmond Becker, who was record, who had hits before me in England that produced the hit that uh, let you uh, you can get it if you really want. Because he had a hit with it before me because the story is, Island Records didn't want to put out that song. So I said, oh, why not? So I said, come Desmond, you sing on this track. And uh, Desmond sang on the track, boom, number one. And then finally I said, come Pioneers, you sing on this track. Let it get me in, boom, top five. So it went like that. So. That was my past. I'm going through it very fast. Um, that was my past, and then uh, you know, presently now, let's come right fast forward to this time. I am. Uh, what am I doing now? I'm presently, reading. Besides writing a lot of new songs, because I'm constantly writing. Uh, I'm also reading the, the first draft of the sequel to the Heart of the Economy. So that's what I'm presently doing now. So, stepping forward into the future, it's about the music that I could. Uh, relate to you, if I can let you have a taste of some of the songs <laughs> that I'm presently writing. They're all registered, so I'm not afraid that they're going to be anything. Um, 